Well, it's a big hello to Pete Jacobs. Good afternoon, Pete. Good afternoon, Labor. Thank you so much for coming on the Become Your Own Superhero podcast as one of our inaugural guests. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, good to be here. We had the pleasure of having your beautiful wife on just the other day, and uh, people can check out Jamie L uh, on the that particular podcast, a very insightful side from the other side of the family. Yeah, I'll be looking forward to hearing that one too. <laughs> so for the, the people listening out there in podcast land, Pete Jacobs is most famously known as the world champion Ironman and is a, a lifelong triathlete and also a low carb athlete in the form of a carnivore. Is there anything else that we can add to your amazing repertoire, Pete? <laughs> no, that's it. Probably just need to explain what Iron Man is to people uh, <laughs> <laughs> potentially. Um, yeah, the Hawaii Iron Man, as people know it back from the 80s on Wide World of Sports. Uh, it's a 3.8 kilometre swim, 180 kilometre cycle, followed by a marathon, 42 Ks, and it's held on the uh, Big Island of Hawaii every second weekend in October nowadays. And uh, in 2012 was the year that I uh, managed to win it. Second the year before, which is also, I guess, a, a notable finish as well. And, and that was an interesting race for me also. <laughs> so just to clarify, you've got all in one day, you've got a marathon, which most people won't do in their lives. You've got a 180 kilometer cycle and 3.8 kilometer swim in the ocean. Is that right? Wow. How does it feel when you finish one of those? Uh, it's always a big relief. I mean, no matter what shape you're in, uh, you're always trashed by the end of it. It's sort of, you know, you're always pushing to your limits and your muscles are always aching and your mind is always pretty exhausted. So yeah, the, the, the relief pretty much when you cross the finish line is um, pretty special, which is why people do it for the finish line. But it's also the journey, I guess. A lot of people will do it because of the journey. And um, yeah, that, that's a big focus on, on getting, building that character, learning about yourself, um, setting those goals and sticking to the commitments in the journey is what changes you. And then, yeah, the finish line is really just the reward and uh, the excuse to party and have a bit of time off. Yeah, it's, it's one of those sports that uh, I, I've never done it's something that I thought about doing and, and I think based on what's been happening in my life, it's, I'm going to have to put it on the list, but it seems to be one of those sports that is on everyone's sort of bucket list. And, you know, it's a, a crowning achievement. And I think it's largely regarded as one of the, the most challenging multi-sports on the planet, if not one of the most challenging sports, full stop. Have you done anything harder in your life? No, no, nothing harder. Um, some races are easier than others. Some are harder than others. I mean, my quickest is um, just over eight hours and my slowest is about 12 and a half hours, I think, once. Um, so, yeah, it, it's hard either way. And, yeah, it's, it is. It's pretty cool. It's, that, that's that, um, it's got that image of being the toughest thing. So it's the sort of thing like, you know, the Americans will be like, I'm going to get so tough, man. I could be an Iron Man. You know, <laughs> like they use it as a, as a phrase to say toughness and fit. And yeah, it has got that stigma in America, at least anyway, where the brand is a bit more well known. Yeah. Um, and where they sort of use the brand Iron Man as a stand in for triathlon almost. Whereas here, Iron Man is still got that history of the surf Iron Man. Um, and it's more just the people that are in the triathlon scene that think of Ironman being synonymous with triathlon. Yeah, right. And because and, uh, you're the last Australian to win the Ironman World Championship, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. We, we had it six years in a row um, between Craig Alexander having three, Chris McCormack having two, and myself having one. We had uh, six years in a row and we haven't won it since. Um, so... <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's a bit of a drought and, um, you know, I'd love to get back there. But, I mean, this year has been put on hold. 2021 may, they may put this year's race back to February. But other than that, um, October next year is the, the long-term goal. 
so I, I've taken a few years off myself and um, yeah, I've had a few breaks and, and looking after my health and trying to fix things up. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping to get back there. Yeah. Well, I was keen to explore that a little bit, Peter, the, you know, coming from such a, an extraordinary height and then there's, there's been this hiatus for, a, for a, you know, a long time now in the world of sport, I suppose. What's been happening in your life that sort of allowed all of this to happen? What, what is, what's been going on? Oh, well, you want the full story from uh, the beginning? Um, Absolutely. Started, shoot. started getting fatigued when I was a teenager. Um, then sort of got into triathlon around that, that time, around 18 years old, like a few years after the fatigue came in. Got into Ironman pretty soon after that and did a couple as an age grouper. Um, and I found the, the training getting pretty hard. The second year I had fatigue issues and didn't perform well at all. And then through that, doing my uh, landscaping apprenticeship. And then I realized when that was finished, I wanted to be a professional triathlete. And I had in my mind the goal to win Hawaii at that point. That was it. I, I believed I could be the best in the world. Wow. Uh, um, it took 10 years to achieve that goal. But in that time frame, I had to really learn to deal with the fatigue that kept coming back. Unexplained fatigue, no blood tests, no hair, urine stool you name it i've had it tested um everything pretty much everything always came back pretty good and but i just had to manage manage it mentally so i just learned to deal with ego um and when i was fatigued i didn't push it in training i just did what i could do yeah and i learned to turn my my weakness into my strength so in 2011 i placed second and from that day on it was like okay focus on the win and I needed to embrace that I couldn't do as much as other athletes. I couldn't do as much. If I was going to beat them, I actually needed to do less than them. I needed to do what I could do. So that's how I uh, turned my weakness into my strength. And that made all the difference. It gave me the confidence to not feel guilty for missing a session, for not pushing myself when I was tired, just, and just doing only what I could do on the day and being happy with that. But... I changed it up by setting myself a goal of three things a day that was good for my health or good for my, good for my performance on race day. But those three things, whether it could have been swim, bike, run, yeah. but it also was napping, massage, foam rolling, um, you name it, acupuncture or yoga, Pilates, whatever it was, it didn't have to be an exercise session or pushing myself to count as a productive session in my lead up to Hawaii into, into the world champs. And so for about two and a half, three months, that was the whole focus. So there was nothing else to do. It was just, you know, make sure that there's food at home, which was, you know, partly what Jamie was up to and nap. If I needed to nap, didn't need to be on the computer. Didn't need to do anything. That was it back in the day. Um, that was 2000 and 12 um that year and uh, instagram wasn't really around it was early days uh so those sort of things didn't take up time you didn't have other commitments so it was really you know when i think back to it it was a really nice at uh, that time that period of leading into hawaii and then right up to race morning till the gun goes is a fairly serene and um calm my period of, of my life every year it was. And um, yeah, I look back on it quite fondly that the, the commitment that I gave at that point, you know, always makes me quite happy. That also fills me with um, that sense of achievement every time. Yeah, for sure. It's an extraordinary. And then, yeah. yeah. Extraordinary and then since then, sorry. so then I'll go on. Yeah, I, I, I just remembered your question sort of since then the health issues. So fatigue got worse. Um, I kept battling away for another sort of five years and then got to 2017. Uh, wasn't really getting the improvements I needed. Um, so what I had sort to of take... fatigue, what sort of fatigue are you talking about? Sort of specifics, like what things were happening physically? Yeah. Well, when I was younger, it would just be like a day, um, of not being able to push my heart rate. Like I literally couldn't push my body to move fast or hard. Um, and then, so as I got older, that became maybe a, a week at a time, 
then a bit older it became more prevalent in some weaknesses which sort of manifested as injuries or it would throw out my body from imbalances so yeah. you know certain muscles just not firing mean then you're going to have other weaknesses and compensate so you might be able to get the work done but if i'm doing it under a, a quite a lot of fatigue and inflammation then i'm doing it uh in an uneven way and that led to injuries and then as i yeah turned 30 when i was uh world champ when i won 2012 and at that point yeah it, it became more like a month at a time and um so a month of feeling like very very fatigued like i wouldn't want to get out of bed that was that was the main thing just want so to stay pretty in hardcore kind of like chronic lethargy. chronic fatigue brain yeah, yeah. brain real really bad brain fog um couldn't even write emails the sense of sort of um anxiety around having to do anything that required thought was like you know a part of it no joy so i wouldn't want to go surfing uh you know you couldn't convince me to do anything fun didn't want to leave the house um yeah just complete exhaustion and and um then as I got older again, the aches and pains in joints sort of flared up a bit more. Yeah, right. And yeah, that was sort of, it was funny when I actually decided, right, I need to take 2018 completely off until I can figure this out. There's no point doing it half-hearted until I, you know, know exactly that I'm 100% and can do what I want to do and get back to the top level. Um, in 2018, at the start, I wasn't doing any exercise and my aches and pains in my feet and ankles when I woke up in the morning was just excruciating and I wasn't exercising. I wasn't doing anything. So towards that time, like obviously I'm listening to so many podcasts. I'd, I'd been speaking to Phil Maffetone in person or, or on Skype. Um, and that helped quite a bit going low carb and, and training to math heart rate, aerobic heart rate, but it wasn't the answer. But towards the end of 18, uh, that was when it was, um, and I'd had bowel issues as well since in like early twenties that I'd always just tried to do the best as I could with the issues. Yeah. Um, but never, never finding anything else out really. Um, no consistency in, in my symptoms from whether I was training or eating certain things. Like I might feel great for six weeks, train hard, then be in a hole for six weeks and nothing else had changed. I hadn't, changed a lot of stuff so it was sort of like man what is it like you're trying to think what what was it that, yeah, that triggered yeah. it um now looking back I, I i can give much better explanations as to why and how um but nobody could give me explanations back then and i'd seen a lot of different practitioners but towards the 20 end of 2018 um i did hear that oh you know what if you've got sort of ibs type symptoms you actually might do better on low fiber and if you're keto, you can actually eat a bunch of protein yeah. and you're still going to be keto. And it was like, oh, you know, looking back, the years of listening to keto podcasts and some of the tools that are out there saying <laughs> you can't eat protein because it turns to blood sugar. Oh, I just wish I could wring their necks. Like, you know, so, so annoying. So I dropped my fiber, increased my protein you know, became about 90% carnivore and, and pretty quickly started to see improvements, weight dropping. I could train more, felt better. Um, and then got in touch with, uh, Dr. Paul Mason, um, who's been on all the low carb down under videos. He's got, you know, he's been on countless podcasts and interviews. Um, and, uh, and he gave me the confidence to go full carnivore. He said, look, that, that cacao that you're still having, um, in terms of, you know, some hot chocolates or homemade chocolate, um, you know, skip, skip that. That's got high lectins and a few other things. He just said, go full carnival. Look. Yeah. And I was like, okay, thank you. Um, thank you, doctor. <laughs> I got, and I got better, but I was still having relapses and it was like, what the hell is going on? Cause I'm only eating like meat, fish, eggs. Um, that was it. And eventually i came across histamine by chance on a youtube um by dr georgia Ede. um and it Shout was one she'd done georgia Ede, by the way and Paul yeah, Mason. long long time ago she'd done this this presentation and i was like that's exactly my symptoms and suddenly i looked looked back at my symptoms 
in the, that year, in like sort of 2019, I was feeling better, but I was still getting some relapses. And my relapses by this point were a little bit of fatigue. It was much, much better, but my skin would flare up. You know, I've, I've had sort of seborrheic dermatitis for a long time and I've just had gastro for about five days. So yeah, you can see I've got some redness in my chin, um, you know, a little bit of redness on my skin, but I've got some redness you know, when, in I, shirt. <laughs> when I was younger, it was like, it, or just a couple of years ago, like really bad, really flaky skin in my face. And I'd hate to go outside like that too. So that's a horrible thing for anybody to have. Um, and I, was, I could link back those symptoms to aged meat or when I'd had like a lot of yogurt, you know, so anything high bacteria. And I was like, right, let's cut out the histamine. So I went all like fresh frozen food, cooked quick. Um, and it took a while for me to have that before I started losing those symptoms. And one of the main symptoms was when I eat, my nose would just run a little bit. And so once that stopped happening and I went a bit longer, um, you know, and I started to feel better and everything came good. Then I was like, okay, I'm, I'm getting better. Um, so I'm getting better, but you know, it was probably six weeks ago that I just, I still, I'm still learning um, as, as we all are, cause we're, I'm a, I'm a bit of a slow learner. Like I was starting to train harder and I was starting to have like little nibbles of all the, the cake, banana cake that Jamie was making and then Easter came and I was having a little bit of chocolate, which became a binge on chocolate because I, <laughs> yeah. I can't do, I can't do moderation. My mindset is just terrible. Um, when I'm tired and fatigued and anyone who's had fatigue will, will um, relate. Like when you are feeling fatigued, you have no willpower. Your brain says, give me energy and energy is sugar. And it's like, there's just no moderation at that point because you're, you're so fatigued and your brain's not working. So, you know, combining all of these things several weeks ago, hard training, the fatigue was building up. I could feel it, but I was still trying to do some training. Then I binged on chocolate over Easter and yeah, it was just like back to square one. My nose started running when I was eating a can um, and yeah, a few other symptoms and just was like, right, this is, you know, I'm, I've, I've done it to myself and I, and I totally did it to myself. But when you add just a little bit in at a time, you don't kind of see that you're actually adding in several different things back in plus, you know, increasing the stress a little bit from each aspect, a little bit more stress from training, a little bit more stress from nutrition, a little bit more stress from, um, you know, not recovering as well. And, and the gut starting to be a bit more permeable adding stress. And, uh, yes, yeah, so those, those things sort of happen like that. So, um, so I'm at the point now where I'm understanding things much better. I'm understanding there's the stress overload issue much better. And, you know, now that races have been put on hold, it's, it's probably not bad timing because I just did myself a number and could actually use the, use the bit of extra time to get myself back to, back to feeling amazing back to being, you know, pretty, pretty much strict carnivore plus coffee um, and get, get everything, get my cells back to a really, really resilient point and then just forego that thought of, well, I'm feeling great so I can start to trickle stuff back in. I'll just, I'll just leave that stuff out. So that's I, where I'm at. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can totally identify with that. And I, and I realize, you know, if you're looking at, at watching or listening to this and thinking, you know, wow, what are they talking about? There, there is some technicality in there just with regards to, you know, anti-nutrients that exist in most food, but it seemed to be a lot more prolific in plants. And then you've got histamines, you know, like a bacterial growth. And if you've got any uh, existing imbalance in your body, it will exacerbate a lot of those problems. And, you know, what, what you're talking about here, Pete, is something that there's no, there's no guide for. There's no, like all the other protocols that exist with the food pyramid, there's no rule book on, on doing, you know, what you and I, you and I are in a very similar uh, eating protocol mm. for similar reasons, really. And it's, it's not that, we're trying to demonize all the other stuff. It's, this is out of necessity. And when mm. you feel as good as you can, when you're eating like this, you really seem to notice 
when you do reintroduce something that your body just says, ah, uh-uh, no, thank you. No, thank you very mm. much. Yeah. I mean, a guidebook on mitochondrial function would be perfect. <laughs> um, because that would take everything into account. It'd take, it'd explain oxidative stress when you exercise, it would explain inflammation when your gut's a bit permeable and it would, and it would beautifully combine everything together in a simple way that you could understand how the body actually works and nobody's done it, unfortunately. And that's why people the world over and millions of people have issues with IBS and GI distress have issues with a bit of fatigue or arthritis and aches and pains. Yeah. And they have, there's absolutely no way for them to find out what's going wrong because there's nothing out there that says this is a dysregulation of your mitochondria that uh, your cells are not healthy enough to be robust enough. Therefore you're feeling it everywhere. And you now you're in a vicious cycle because you're eating food that's making your gut more permeable. And then that's causing the aches and pains and brain fog. And then the brain fogs and top fatigues causing you to keep eating those foods that you shouldn't be eating. And the inflammation increases and increases and increases. And like, yeah, it it would be nice. And I'm, I'm trying to work on explaining it, um, you know, to guys, like I did a consult call with a guy yesterday. He was over in uh, Pennsylvania. And those exact symptoms of just GI issues, um, aches and pains sort of in some of his joints. And he's an ultra marathoner. But he's training some really high intensity training. Yeah. And he's still eating. uh, He's kind of was already starting to go carnivore. But before he started carnivore, he tried the vegan way or vegetarian way. He tries to eat legumes. And every time he eats legumes, he feels worse. And so just to explain to him the whole lectin, gut permeability, the proteins then getting through from the plants, then getting through, and that's causing the aches and pains, like the cycle to him, he was like, that's perfect because he'd had the sort of hypothesis. He kind of was starting to figure out that there was something there, but unfortunately there's so much information out there. Um, and, and we've all done it. This is what I did for buddy 20 years is go down a path of FODMAPs or go down a path of stool testing to try and get rid of blastocystis hominis or going down a path of, um, having, uh, supplements, you know, more, more, or you just need more vitamins and more minerals. Let's, let's get you on a, a program of, of, of a subscription to supplements. Um, and there's so many different diets out there that, that cut off certain things, the gluten-free one, the this, that, and the other. And um, yeah. And then based at the end of the day, if you're experiencing any of these symptoms, you need to go back to carnival for two weeks and cut all plants and then reintroduce some of those plants. Forget about whether it's um, gluten-free nightshade grains, FODMAP, um, sugar-free, dairy-free, all of that cut it all out except for meat, fish and eggs and then reintroduce one thing every few days. And that is how you are going to heal your gut. Um, And obviously if your symptoms don't completely go away in two weeks, but you're feeling, you'll be feeling much, much better. Yeah. Then you just keep, keep going until your symptoms actually get back to kind of zero um, and then start reintroducing some things. But the problem is like if, if you're, if you're, if you're exercising and, and you're adding that stress in, so everybody that exercises quite solidly, or maybe if you particularly if you're a runner, because that impact produces a lot of, you know, oxidative stress and a lot of muscle damage, that stress in itself means that your cells are under more stress. So you can't then add in all these plants as well. So you've got to try and have, um, you're not going to be able to go back to the diet that you had when you were five years old, 10 years old. You're no longer going to be able to have gluten. You're no longer going to be have, um, you know, all this raw spinach, which has the oxalates. You're not going to be have all these cakes and stuff, even if they're gluten free. Um, because you're already loading your body up with stress from the exercise. And you're probably got a job that's adding to stress as well. You're probably in front of a computer screen and stress and, the the brain itself is causing stress so 
you've got to kind of take into account and not say to yourself, oh, I just want to get back to the point where I can eat everything again. And it's like, well, you're probably never going to get back there. You've probably already done enough damage. You've put your body under so much stress for your entire lifetime to this point mm. you're, where you're not, and you want to keep adding stress. You know, you're, you're keeping to add work and exercise stress. You can't add a whole heap of plant toxins into the gut on top of that because your gut permeability, your gut mucus layer is not strong enough because it's already under too much stress. So you've got to just take it easy on the nutritional front. You know, you've got to pick your battles and pick your stress overload. And basically if you had a cup and you were filling that cup with different portions of stress, you know, you can't just add in heaps of everything because the cup's going to overfill and overflow. And, and that's the, that's the, um, that's the theory or the, the, the thought that I'm really trying to get across to people um, when I talk to them nowadays is the overload. You have to keep in mind the overload as much as I tell them, I did it to myself several weeks ago, <laughs> but um, yeah, you got to try and keep learning those thresholds and listening and not try to get back to way, where, where we once were when we were younger, but just get to that point that we can sustain mm. and feel good because it's just about wanting to feel good. It's not about, it's not about having to be low carb. It's not about having to, you know, have um, cut out sweets or processed stuff as much. It's just about what do we have to do to feel good? That's what we will do. Yeah. And, I, and, and you're right. It's, it's, this has been basically a two year long experiment for me. And I've only just recently gotten to a point where I was able to totally lose any interest in sugar. And it, I was able to conquer it, you know, maybe within the last five months, six months through willpower, but willpower runs out. Mm. And I would have moments where I would eat chocolate or whatever, or, and in comparison to what I'm eating sugar wise or was eating versus four or five years ago when I was just eating a standard diet, I mean, you're still talking a dramatic reduction, probably 95 96 percent reduction and and i think you know the way that you that you communicate this that's really important for people watching that you the cheat meals that you're having still only translate to a very very small percentage of what you're actually ingesting compared to a standard western diet where people are having 25 30 grams 40 50 grams of sugar a day uh just without even realizing it and the, at, the, every, at every meal and it, you know in every meal and and the like myself, what the, the issues that you had stemmed from an autoimmune response. And a lot of people can be asymptomatic with regards to these autoimmune issues, as in they don't feel anything. You all started to manifest themselves in your 20s or in your late teens. Yeah. Is there anyone else in the family that's been suffering through anything similar? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my mum and I have almost matching symptoms. Uh, um everything sort of happens even to the point, And this is just weird that my mum got a gastro bug about two or three months ago. And then I got a gastro bug like a week ago. Like wow. we just keep mirroring each other. Like I'll have a sore foot. She'll get a sore foot, but forgetting the woo woo, like coincidental side of stuff, we have the same autoimmune symptoms. Um, but obviously her being much older and having been on medications pretty much since I was born, that was the start of her high blood pressure. So she went on high blood pressure medication, you know, 38 years ago, um, got told to, you know, drop the salt out of things, you know, eat, eat lower fat and do all of that kind of stuff. So she's then had polymyalgia and been on uh, prednisone for over a decade. So that's been a huge impact Steroid, on her. Steroid, is that right? Yeah. Um, and so her CRP levels have been really high for you know, over a decade. Um, and that, that manifests in the exact same way. You get absolute fatigue, you get brain fog. Um, you're, you're more emotional because of that sort of anxiety and, and, and helpless, helplessness type feeling. Um, and yeah, and it's no coincidence that you get your mitochondria from your mum not from your father in terms of the, the genetics when you're from um, the donors. So the, yeah, we have the same mitochondrial 
issues and yeah, incredible how well we, how closely we match each other. So mum's been on the same journey as me, which she's been carnivore for a couple of years as well. Um, and she's had good, like me, still ups and downs, but overall much, much better progress having cut out the plants, like, you know, much, much better. But um, yeah, having been on and still on medication, it's a, it's a harder process for her and the fact that she's nearly 70. So, you know, these things, you know, take a bit longer when you're older, when you've had more stress in your life and, and still have stress. So there's those issues as well around, um, yeah, the genetics that you inherit can obviously, you know, genetics are a, a big part of it. But yeah. epigenetic epigenetics are a huge part of it as well. Yeah, they are. And I, and I think it's important. One thing that I've really uh, shifted my mindset thinking with in the last year, I think, is the, well, even further back, when I had my digestive issues, which were an autoimmune disease in the form of GERD, I was told by every single medical professional, including the surgeons, that what I had was a genetic disorder and was incurable. And there's absolutely predispositions when it comes to genetic disorders, but there seems to be a link between needing to find the trigger. And it'd be interesting to know with regards to your medical history and your mother's medical history as well, there's a link between traumatic experiences from a med tra like medical trauma in the form of that could be a child born via cesarean section or for example, when I was born, I was born with blocked tear ducts and they operated and opened up the tear ducts and it was minor surgery, but I was still given courses of antibiotics. I then went on mm -hmm. to get bacterial meningitis that I recovered from without any symptoms, but I was smashed with antibiotics. And there seems to be some data coming through linking a, an overload of like these exogenous um, attacking items like antibiotics and and causing intestinal permeability or that leaky gut that you talk about and manifesting itself into an autoimmune response later on. Have you done any reading on that side of things, Pete? Um, not specifically, but yeah, it, it's, it's obvious. It's all part of that same network of uh, overload. Um, and yeah, the, you know, something like a, uh, like a GERD or, or someone saying, Oh, you've got this genetic, response or auto autoimmune issue yeah um yeah eventually like you know it's a bit like eventually people will start to see that processed food isn't good for them and 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 guidelines around the world might change and eventually people might start to become more mainstream around that it's the mitochondria like so metabolic syndrome is a phrase that a lot of um you know, doctors in the more modern world will be using metabolic syndrome. And basically, if you've got a few of the factors of, you know, if your waste is waste is increasing or, or larger than um, your forgotten the percent, the, the proportions, but basically waste, blood pressure, um, triglycerides, um, and uh, there's a few other things. There's a couple of things. And basically, if you've got a few of them, you've got metabolic syndrome, you get yeah. diagnosed. And so everybody with a chronic health condition, autoimmune or heart disease or diabetes, whatever it is, is going to have at least a few of these symptoms. They are going to be qualified as metabolic syndrome. Yeah. But you could also call it uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. And that's my, my viewpoint is that that's, that's much more accurate to say mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, you know, to say it's more at a genetic level rather than old oh, metabolic syndrome, which is people are saying, yes, there's more of an issue around how you're producing energy, how you're converting sugars and fats and those sort of issues, um, as opposed to the description of metabolic syndromes it's, is more, to me, more accurate that it's at a genetic level, like inside the cell, it's what's reproducing the epigenetics, the information that's coming in every day and getting transferred into the new cells that are being built with the genes. Yeah. But those genes are getting turned on and off according to the environment. So as you said, you put in a bunch of antibiotics and you do that over an extended period, or then you add another stress and another stress. 
that extended period of stress while new cells are being made because they are being made all the time while, you know, the amino, the proteins come in, get converted yeah. down to amino acids. And then the amino acids are used to build new proteins again. And that, that protein gets given a, a, a code from the genes to say, well, I want you to be a heart cell. I want you to be a fingernail. I want you to be a, a hair. Um, I want you to be a liver cell. So, you know, those sort of problems that as you um, look at it at a mitochondrial genetic epigenetic level of the information coming in, yeah. when you're reproducing cells under the influence of stressful environmental factors, you are going to get a different output. You're going to get different genes switching on and off. Yeah. And that is where that autoimmune reaction comes in. Because now you've got cells that were made in a stressed environment that are responding to stress very differently to how they did, you know, when you were young. And so that, and you think about it, the cells can, some of them will take a long time to turn over, you know, some turn over quickly like skin and others like your, your organs will turn over longer and your bones turn over a bit longer in time. Yeah. But these cells are still in their body, in your body. They are still responding to the information that they were made with by those genes that they were made with from the signals um, and that's where you get that autoimmune reaction so it is pretty crucial that when you do want to get better you do need to it's it's not just a matter of oh i just need to lower my stress and take some medication that's that's not enough you need to keep stress low because that whole period for years of new cells being produced needs to be done in a really healthy low stress environment which is where the low carb comes in yeah because that, that stress response from having high insulin and high blood sugar, like for often, that stress response when cells and when you're making that, that epigenetic response is going to be a stress in itself. So the low carb thing in terms of long term for getting your body back to kind of as a healthier point is going to take years for those cells to turn over and get healthy again. It just depends how deep, I guess, how deep the well is where you've got to with your autoimmune with your issues of cell damage and dysfunction yeah before how long it's that's how long it's going to take you to get back to the point where you're resilient enough to withstand more stress once again so that's just crucial just keeping everything as chilled and as low stress as possible from all sources so sleep's got to be great Food's got to be right on, yeah. you know, that's to keep your gut permeability low to get your exercise has to be moderate and to low, you know, all of these factors go into it. Emotional stress has to be low. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I think in my own personal experience, my ability to handle environmental and uh, external stresses has improved dramatically when my body healed or was healing and has improve my resilience and my i certainly don't react in the same way that i used to like i'm like i'm way more calm and I, you know like just before we jumped on this this interview today i checked my fasting blood sugar and i haven't eaten today and it's three in the afternoon i haven't done any exercise today uh, i was up very early i took a i did a uh a zoom meeting at 1 a.m for an hour this morning and we went back to sleep and woke up at 6 30 and I've just been on the move since. I've had two black coffees and my fasting blood sugar, 4.6. And four, it was 5.7 to 6 for most of my, my life prior to that, now, even when I quit drinking and all those other things. So it's really interesting experiencing that and my ability to take on and, and you know, have that stress bounce off me has been part of my catalyst for being able to achieve as much as I've achieved in my own mind, certainly in the last two years. And, and I'm only getting better, faster, stronger, more resilient, more optimistic, more bright in my disposition as this goes on. So I, I'm a huge fan. And I yeah. suppose out of all the things that you've experimented with, at least nutrition wise, what's been your favorite? Oh, um, slow cooked meat has to be one of the best uh, um you know um when you're eating as much meat as i do like when i'm training a lot uh, i'll be eating a couple of kilos or, or maybe 
yeah, at least of meat. Um, so I'm not going out and buying, you know, $60 a kilo steak type things. Um, so I, I got a taste for the off cuts and just, I pressure cook or slow cook the off cuts. And I just love that. Um, that meat that falls apart. It's got a bit of sinewy fat through it that just really melts once it's been in cooking a long time. Yeah. Um, other things that I experimented with, you know, things like um, beef jerky. So dehydrating um, different cuts of beef. Um, you know, steaks are good, but um, I do enjoy, and, and, and people will probably think I'm crazy, but fairly raw mints. Um, so, you know, I, but I can buy them. I don't get this off the supermarket and get raw mints out of the supermarket. But um, there's a change that happens when you, when you eat carbohydrates and sugars and plants and, and that sort of stuff all the time, you really, as you had, you had GERD. Um, a really great way. I mean, your stomach acid, when you eat all this, this sugary carbohydrate stuff drops, your body's response to putting food in your gut lowers. You don't produce the hydrochloric acid. When you're unhealthy, you're not going to produce as much hydrochloric acid. When you're unhealthy, you won't produce as much DAO, DOA, uh, DAO, I think, um, for the histamine response. So therefore, that's why I was getting a histamine response. You have all these different chemicals that get produced in response to eating. And so as you eat more meat, the inverse happens. You become better at digesting meat. Your stomach acid comes back. As you get healthier, as you eat more protein, your stomach acid can handle it. So yeah, I have no problem. I love raw meat now. Like I'll raw marrow out of straight out of the bone. Love it. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'll even, I'll even chew it. Like we get the big dog marrow bones, but they, they're for human consumption. They're frozen. I'll eat the marrow out before I give it to the dogs. And I'll even cut a bit off. If there's some nice fleshy red bits, I'll cut a bit off or bite a bit off the bone as well. Yeah. Um, real, real caveman style. And it's like, yes, we are cavemen. We are, we evolved to eat this stuff. We do mm. not need it cooked. Not saying I eat everything raw. I'm not advocating um, that, but I do eat, I do prefer a lot of my meat fairly raw. It's either nice and slow cooked where it falls apart or it's fairly raw and the flavor in it is just, you know, beautiful. Yeah. Um, but that's what I'm at. steak tartare really, are you? Like it's exactly, it's you go out and you pay, a, dish. you pay a fortune for it at the restaurant. And, you know, sometimes, um, so we've made it at home. Um, you know, my parents have been kind of locked here um, while the, the corona things, and they've been here for about six weeks or something. So mum's buying steaks and things because um, she eats more steaks. But when she bought some steaks that weren't that great tasting, I was like, yeah. all right, we'll, we'll, we'll blend them in the food processor, put them in the food processor, and just, just made little tiny little rissoles out of them. And that steak then became, instead of this kind of like flavorless, chewy steak, made our own mints out of it and it was delicious because of the surface area within the steak as it's been broken up into the mints yeah you just get so much more flavor out of it so um yeah so your palate changes as well definitely your palate changes over time as you eat more meat um but i'm still looking for i'm still exploring ways you you would think if if you only ate meat fish and eggs they'd be oh i'm limited what i can do i am still exploring all the different ways that i can cook um those those things and still learning and and you told me the other day um about an air fryer and aldi have one on sale tomorrow and we're going to get one of those so that's going to be a whole new experiment of doing things doing some meat in the air fryer and you know different probably quiches i imagine and um yeah all sorts of things to um play around with well the rule and i is eat a lot of liver liver as well i've got to add in that i do eat heaps um weekly at least uh, a fair bit of liver um you know it's just so high in nutrients and and that's the argument that people when they're a bit like oh you're carnivore how but you're missing all these vitamins and minerals and i go you really want to talk about this all right well here's here's google here's my phone google liver versus vegetable nutrients there you go have a look and it's like hands down. It, it does not even compare in any area what you're getting from animal product. And then you could do it with eggs and eggs would just, I mean, 
There's yeah. a reason they're called, there's a reason they are called essential amino acids and essential fatty acids. And they only exist in animal products. You yeah. cannot get everything you need from plants. You may feel okay, but in terms of um, supplementing, if, if you're not really, really onto it, that you're getting all those essential aminos and essential fatty acids, I mean, you're doing your, your epigenetics for your own long-term health. And then let's say your own epigenetics uh, uh, and what you're passing on if you're going to have kids as well in that state of basically malnutrition. So it's funny that often people that are saying, well, you're going to be devoid of nutrients. You know, if we actually did a, a, a fair side-by-side -side comparison, there would be no comparison. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that, that whole liver thing in the wild, wolves, when they attack animals, typically just go for the liver. And, you know, speaking of wolves, the, in terms of the, you know, your comments regarding stomach acid, the cause of heartburn is low acid in most cases mm. and yeah. our stomachs the, the hydrochloric acid in there is almost that of a wolf which is a scavenger mm. animal like and and yeah. i don't know about you pete but my i had horrendous gas bat, like belching and really toxic mm. farts for ever since i was a baby my mum will happily come on this and tell about you know some of the horrendous nappies that i used to leave behind and I can honestly say, hand on heart, since I've gone carnivore, when I deviate, when I, when I don't put any, any plant matter in there at all, I don't have any belching or any gas. I have way less frequent bowel movements, TMI, but like all the good things in life that you want out of it. And, yeah. and I, I don't have to worry about food or hunger as much anymore. It's really yeah. fascinating. Uh, yeah farting you kind of forget about it <laughs> you kind of Until every now and then back. you think well yeah if you if you deviate off the off what you're eating but every now and then you realize geez i haven't farted for a while and like you're you, but you just sort of don't notice that you're not doing it yeah but i mean i'm sure i mean i think the majority of the population do have an ibs issue um you know they just sort of deal with it and say well I'll deal with it if it still means I can have my beer or still means I can eat my bread. And it's like, yeah, that's your choice. Cool. Good, good, uh, good, good choice. Um, but yeah, for those that uh, also want to get more energy that want to get clear ahead that want to feel more motivated because they've got the energy in their brain that want to feel just better in life or perform better. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's a really easy way to, um, change what they're eating as the first step i mean there's heaps of other steps that you can take um i mean yeah as it's funny when you mentioned getting up at 1 a.m to to look at a screen for uh an hour i mean you could only do that because you had the resilience to do that i mean if you're already feeling fatigued if as as the majority of the population if you're already not feeling good and then you had to do that or you have a baby and then you've got to get up every night while after being feeling terrible. I yeah. mean, imagine that how you're going to feel the next day after adding that into when you, when you're not resilient enough. And I mean, then you add in, you're already tired. So, so you don't get good sleep. Then you binge on food and a poor night's sleep will make you more insulin resistant. So basically that means the, the blood sugar is going to stay higher for longer after eating carbohydrates, which means inflammation hangs around longer, more insulin is pumped out. That's the, that's the beginning of what happens and why you get diabetes is because your insulin's high all the time, trying to yeah. clear out a constantly high blood sugar. Um, so you're already insulin resistant from a, a, a poor diet. You get more insulin resistant from a poor night's sleep. You're tired. So you binge on crappy food the next day as well. And, you know, that's when that overload will happen. And that's when, you know, it, it, it hits the fan and there's a mess. And, yeah. and most people that have a chronic, uh, a chronic illness or a chronic disease could pinpoint it back to a time in their life where there was that overload of stress, you know, where they were going through a, a, a breakup of some sort or they were, they got fired or they did train really hard um, or they lived somewhere else and maybe they did have a poorer diet at that time. And, you know, they can pinpoint this overload 
pretty clearly within that time frame yeah. of when it, it occurred not long after. Yeah. Well, look, this is a topic that I'm very, very interested and very passionate about and, and will continue to be while I'm self-experimenting. But there was a, a request from a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, uh, Anthony Maguire, who's the high performance coach at the cricket club at Melbourne University, where, I, where I'm a member and play. And he's competed in quite a few half Ironman efforts. He's in his late 40s now. I won't say exactly how old, but he's in great nick. And he's one of the most mentally tough guys uh, that I've ever met. And, and he was curious to know about, um, there was the central governance system that you referenced in one of your other interviews. And I was keen to explore and get, get you to explain it because it's not something that I'm familiar with and I'm keen to know what actually it is and how it helps you as an athlete. Yeah, well, the central governor theory um, was developed by Professor Tim Noakes, who a lot of people will have heard of in, um, and in one way or another. Uh, he's been around for decades and decades, since about the 70s. Um, and basically, the theory is that the brain is what is controlling your ability to perform. So the 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 you're on the start line imagine right and on the start line you've got everything that you've trained for so physically that's your limitations ideally right your biological point at, at that time whether you're healthy you've adapted aerobically you've got all that kind of stuff you've done the training and hopefully you've tapered and rested well that's not real well that's that's one that's one limitation the other limitation is what you can do with that, how you can push your body to do more. Um, and it was from another presenter that I, I like the analogy of if you're going along and, and a lion jumps out of the bushes at you in that first minute, you will easily run through like some really prickly bushes to get away from that lion. But yeah. if that lion is chasing you, you know, two hours later still, and you come across this equally painful prickly bush, you know, your motivation to get through there and pain tolerance is, is not as good as it was before. So it, it's got nothing to do with nothing else has changed except what's going on in your head. So, you know, the hormones, the, the pain tolerance, motivation, adrenaline, all of that kind of stuff has changed. Um, and Tim Noakes is, example is great that uh, why does the bloke that crosses the line in second place, why doesn't he cross the line and, and drop dead almost? Why hasn't he run to complete exhaustion? Why hasn't his body allowed him to push so hard that he literally can't take another step? Um, and, you know, so that the, the central governor theory means that there's a governor a, a, in terms of a limitation. You might know about it if you have a, a car or a scooter that can't go over a certain speed it's got a governor yeah. on it limiting yeah, its yeah. speed so the central governor is Not your brain governor. yeah the central governor theory um by tim noakes is that your brain is the thing that is limiting your performance it is up there saying it's getting hot um and if you're not real fat adapted the first thing it's going to say is my blood sugar is getting low and that's going to be the first red flag where it goes, no, nah, we're shutting this down. We cannot continue to run. My blood sugar is getting low. And so that's where bonking happens. You have not run out of energy. Your muscles are still full of glycogen, which can be used as glucose. You've got heaps of glucose, uh, glycogen stored in your liver as well. You've still got a body full of fat. So you've got absolutely no problem with fuel. You've got fuel for, for quite a long time still. But because the blood sugar has dropped, that perception of a lack of energy is what has shut your body down. Yeah. And that is, that's part of, that's one thing. I mean, there are endless things in your perception of your energy that is going to be the central governing limitation of your performance. And I just love it because it, it just... Like I said, you can come back to perception is everything, you know, perception of, and that's why confidence is such a big thing in sport because confidence is your central governor. It, it's boosting its limitation. Instead of you, your brain having this 
concept of I can only go this hard. If, if that's up here already, then you've already got an extra ability for your brain to push harder. And, and what's happening a little bit with that, coming back to the pain tolerance line chasing your story, the central governor, if you can remain calm throughout the, the first part of the race. So let's say it's an Ironman and for the first six hours, you can remain really calm and you're not exhausting that pain tolerance. So even though your effort might be the same as the person next to you, if the person next to you is experiencing a mental anguish and anxiety, so they don't have your confidence and they're already telling themselves, wow, I'm going harder than I should. Wow, I don't think I can do this. They're exhausting that pain tolerance already. Whereas if you are confident and you stay calm, you know, there's a whole bunch of nervous system automatic responses that don't kick in. So when it comes to the back end of the race, you have actually gone easier because of your perception of the effort. And therefore you've got more energy and energy in quote marks, because energy is, um, is not what I just, every time people refer to energy, it kind of frustrates me because it's always used as yet yeah, instead of saying perception of energy, yeah. it's people are saying, Oh, I had more energy. And it's like, well, you didn't have more energy because the energy, it didn't give you more energy. Like, um, in a roundabout way it did, but it's the perception of energy that gave you more energy. And it wasn't energy only exists on demand. Like it's not like you've got extra energy floating around in your body. The energy exists on demand or the perception of energy. So if you can push your muscles harder, you will produce more energy. So that's where energy comes into it. So that's where um, it comes into the, you don't get more energy from having a gel you get a better perception of energy if you have low blood sugar and we're experiencing a low perceived energy, then, you know, that gel increases your blood sugar. Therefore your brain says I'm feeling safer. Therefore you're able to work your muscles more and therefore energy is produced greater because there's a greater demand for it. So yeah, um, the, the, the central governor theory is, kind of like that 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 energy exists on demand and it is your brain that is controlling that demand that ability to trigger the muscles to to move um it, it's coming from your brain that's brilliant that well that ties in beautifully with the actual question that anthony was cu- <laughs> curious to ask and it was along the lines of um if you're happy to share Pete, what are some of the mental toughness strategies that you use that have been really effective maybe especially the year you won yeah the year i won it was an obvious one the year i won um was all about love and and love was my trigger word for bringing me back into the moment so uh, to answer the question the key strategy for being more having better energy is to be in the moment because in the moment you don't have those anxieties of did I train enough? Yeah. Is that person catching me? And then the future stuff, like, are they going to catch me? How much further have I got to go? Um, how hot is it getting? All of that stuff that exists outside of this moment in time. Because in this present moment, there is no thought. A thought can't exist in the, if you're really, really in the present moment. And that's what being in the zone is, is talking about. And the flow, um, they call it. it- flow state. Yeah. Yep. Um, all of these analogies are just describing being in the moment, the present. And so, yeah. So one of the things that I did in 2012 was um, I'd seen a kinesiologist who told me that I needed to use the word love more to basically to clear those anxieties, to clear the doubts, to clear the fears, to clear the, the trolls. You know, I had to love them to, you know, not have that, fear or doubt carried with me so i use the word love and um, i'd use it in training i'd visualize scenarios then i'd say the word love and that that i would i would just visualize something in training that would question my confidence and ability and i would feel weaker 
and I would say the word love and I would feel stronger. So by absolutely just being present moment, um, the energy that you get, and it comes back to central governor. Like if you could be in that flow state, the entire race, like everything is easier. The nervous system response is so much lower. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think we're really um, not even touching on the amount of mind training that, that athletes could be doing um, to reduce that nervous system response and to have more, um, more perceived energy um, or a lowered, a lowered perceived energy exertion, lower perceived exertion during the race. Um, so yeah, use the word love, love for family, love for the pain, love for the challenge. Um, but as I said, that was a trigger word. Um, nowadays in training, I'll use a trigger word, like particularly in the gym, going up to lift something heavy. Yeah. No expect, no expectations. So that word, no expectations. Oh, you know, because when you use a trigger word, when you practice using it, the, the quicker you can get into that state just by hearing it or by you know, that thing happening. So I walk up to a weight, no expectations. And, and, and I just feel this calmness come over me because the trigger word of, Oh, it doesn't matter. It, what, what's about to happen doesn't exist. So it doesn't matter and it doesn't exist. So that's a good one, but you just have to find a, a word or a trigger phrase. You know, people take pictures of their family onto their bike top tubes and and so that reminds them of of being in the moment um it just calms their mind so lots of trigger words but you definitely just have to practice it and so being in the gym is a great place to practice it because of that stress that looming stress of a heavy yeah. weight most people want to psych themselves up and and walk into the weight going oh okay i can do this i can do it <laughs> like they're gritting their teeth and tensing their traps before they've even started doing anything yeah um and if if that response happens while you're doing it then you got to stop and start again there is there's no point there is a point and it works for some people to be in that state to get that response but you aren't training your body to do its best performance with a lower perceived effort and a calmer state so if you want to train a lot more if you want to train more you want to train harder you need to learn how to be in the present moment and lower that perceived effort so that you're not getting that emotional response, which is jacking up the nervous system yeah. even more. So let's say you, you were going to go to like a, an eight out of 10 for the nervous system. You're already going into cortisol, adrenaline and this response. But then let's say you have that, you know, you've practiced that trigger word. You can calm yourself then you can drop that just down a bit. And so you're only hitting a seven. So that um, hormonal response isn't as big and you don't get stronger from the hormonal response. You don't get stronger because you've released more blood sugar. You don't get stronger because you've released more adrenaline. None of that is, is real. That is just your perception. And so your perception of having to psych yourself up to do the heavy weight. Yeah is exactly that it is just your perception of what you believe you need to do but you don't need to do that to lift a heavy weight if you're in the moment if you're calm and practice it you will be able to lift more weight in a calmer state than in that adrenaline fueled state and you keep training in that adrenaline fueled state you will get injuries yeah you will get fatigue you'll get nervous system burnout you will get emotionally exhausted as we've talked about the whole podcast that emotional exhaustion from you know using your your willpower to do certain things that it, it runs out so yeah it's um that's one of my favorite sort of topics at the moment is all the different way all the different ways that we can lower our perception of effort which therefore allows us to practice what we need for race day so on race day we're calmer yeah. And then it also means that we can train better and more with less risk of fatigue, injuries, um, and um, burnout. I think there's a, be a few boys down at the cricket club that will uh, certainly benefit from, <laughs> from those comments, Pete. <laughs> Look, before we wrap things up, is there a favorite story that you love to tell of your life? Doesn't have to be Ironman related. <laughs> 
Um, I got but a it terrible memory can be because it's a bloody great story. Yeah, I've got a terrible memory because of all the fatigue issues that I've had since I was a, about 15 years old, and and I'm sure that's related to my terrible memory. Um, but yeah, one of them the year before when I got second, um, that was one of the most painful experiences that I've ever been in. So in Hawaii, I was um, I got off the bike maybe in about 12th place that year, and ran up passed the guy for, for second place and I passed him feeling good at about the 30k mark about one kilometer later my quads absolutely shattered and I felt terrible I could barely run I was in such pain I was walking the aid stations the guy had pulled off to the toilet when I passed him so I had a bit of a break so it was probably about 4k later before he caught back up to me and it's all on video and I love, I'm so grateful that the, the guys that were filming is for the, as um, NBC um, sent this all to me off the back of the motorbike and he caught up to me and I'd been resting. So I'd, I'd been in that, I'd been aware enough to be like, okay, I need to just rest. I need to switch up the muscles that I'm using. Um, so I started to try and run a bit more forefoot and take the pressure off my quads a bit. Um, so when he came back and I was walking aid stations, like they're, they're, they're 75 meter long aid stations there. <laughs> I was walking a lot, but when he came past me, I was ready and I gave him about 10 meters and just held it there. And I just leaned forward. I looked at the ground and like, I still get chills because this is the most in the zone I've ever been in my life. It's the most pain I've ever been in during a race. Um, well, the most pain while ignoring the pain while still pushing. Um, and I sat there 10 meters behind and then he started to crack and I just held the exact same pace and I went straight by him. And I also love that the technique I had was great. You know, he was almost leaning back. He's, you know, sitting back on his heels a bit. His back was tight. I was leaning forward. So the momentum was carrying me forward and, um, I had a better, better form. And so I went past him and just held that pace. And at that point, when I had the break, you know, thinking back to that moment of just right, right, I've got 5k left to run. I just need to keep moving to get second place. And, and then it was just complete. Nothing existed because of the pain. I just kept moving forward. Um, and yeah, so an incredibly emotional finish line, um, because of what I'd gone through, because I'd gone through that emotional pain, but then blocking it, but then that definitely that anxiety towards the last kilometer of like looking back behind me every few hundred, every hundred meters to be like, have I got it? Have I got it? And then, you know, the relief when I finally knew that I had it, um, you know, that was, that was pretty cool and pretty special. So I really, I'm grateful that I had that experience of, it hurting so bad and overcoming it in that way um, and being such an emotional finish line because the year later it was, it was one of the easiest races I'd ever done because of the visualization, because of the training, because of the state that I was in on the start line and the state that I was in throughout the whole race, it, it was actually quite relatively easy. So I'm, um, you know, I love both of those experiences almost equally. When I look back on them, obviously at the time winning, just hands down. Um, but for me, as, as a personal experience, um, coming second was yeah one of those, you know, great moments that I'll always remember. Ah, that's brilliant, Pete. And, and Pete is actually a, a professional speaker and he also does a lot of coaching as well. And if you're interested in, uh, accessing Pete and his amazing background and some of those skills. Uh, we'll post all of uh, Pete's details, socials down in the YouTube link below. But in terms of today, Pete, this has been an absolute thrill. It's not often I get to hang around with uh, the world's best athletes. And I think I'm personally very excited to see the progression that you're making now and, and how that's going to impact in the next couple of years, particularly as you're getting in your late thirties as I am. Mm -hmm. And, you know, looking forward to see you run over that finish line maybe one more time as a fat adapted athlete and just to, to give the naysayers something to, to think about. Yeah, Sorry. absolutely. Yep. So we can put it up and say, you know, what you think is energy 
you think energy is sugar, I'm here to tell you it's not. You know, that's, uh, that's what I'd love to go and explain to them and show them. That's really great, Pete. And I just wanted to thank you again for being a, a guest on the Become Your Own Superhero podcast today. And absolutely look forward to maybe getting you on in the future and discussing uh, some of the things that might happen between now and then. So have a blessed day, everybody, and look forward to seeing you soon.